you're listening to the Down East Mike Podcast, the quirky little podcast from me. And now, your host, Down East Mike. Dee, 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 dee. Good morning, everybody. This is Down East Mike, and you're listening to the Down East Mike Podcast, coming to you live from Down East Maine, way down East Maine. Down East Mike, episode number 85. News and commentary for Saturday, April 22nd, 2023. Matching right along in this year. It won't be long and we will be into well into summer. I'd like to have a funny story to start off the day, but I really don't. So we're probably just going to be leaping right into headlines and stuff. But we should tell you our disclaimer, which is that some of this is whimsy. Some of this is true. And the interpretation of it all is entirely up to you. The Down East Mike podcast contains no mean words, just wholesome goodness from Down East Maine, a historical literary auditory candy store. And we asked, did you hear the bells on the door when you came in? In today's episode, we have mobile homes representing 75% of new housing built. That's from this uh, this story from this day in April 22nd, 1970. We have Dandelion Salad, April 22nd, 1980. This was Fast Day in 1892. We'll look at that. We have the illness of the instant. And we have Maine's toe-biting beetle. All kinds of fun things to look forward to in the podcast today. Let's look at the uh, international headlines. Um, New wave of GOP candidates to challenge Trump and DeSantis. That election's way off in the future, and they're already talking all about it. New York City Mayor Eric Adams says migrant crisis under Biden administration has destroyed the city. The FBI is closing in on two dozen gamers and the Pentagon leakers discord. Alligator dies two months after being found in a New York City park. Not surprising there. Um, Record-breaking Bruins earn huge Game 3 win over the Panthers to take series lead for those of you keeping track. Governor Newsom of California is directing the National Guard to help combat San Francisco's fentanyl crisis. I picture the troops marching down the street there. Uh, Bud Light marketing exec behind Dylan Mulvaney's partnership takes a leave of absence. And a CNN anchor asks if the U.S. wants four more years of Biden when 74% of Americans say that the U.S. is headed in the wrong direction. That's the international headlines. That's everything that's significant. Uh, Main headlines, we have, uh, just looking here for something exciting. uh, Police find the missing 95-year-old Falmouth man. That's nice. Um, The railroad that uh, had the railroad accident up in northern Maine, railroad spills 500 gallons of fuel in the northern Maine derailment cleanup in the state has said either you clean it up or we'll clean it up and send you the bill. That's too bad. Probably a pretty inaccessible area up there where that occurred. Anything else happening in Maine? There's a head-on crash in Route 1A in Ellsworth. That's a very dangerous road. And there was a a missing 75-year-old man in Phillips, Maine. He was found safe. I'm probably about the only one that's not missing this morning. yeah, that's about it for Maine news. It, it's just uh, pretty quiet. The Portland, Portland's newest airline is expanding service. That's that uh, Breeze Airlines, and they've added a sixth destination, and uh, that is well, it's going to be a Breeze to fly. They're based out of Utah. They should start flying uh, June 28th out of Portland, and they it's a year-round service between. Portland and Tampa, and then they'll also be going to South Carolina and uh, Orlando, some other places. New airline they're starting up. 
Well, let's look back on uh, oh, our, our illness of the instant I almost forgot. Ladder leg. Ladder leg is a medical uh, condition that impacts primarily men, middle-aged men uh, that uh, climb ladders and they you can develop ladder leg probably about the sixth or seventh rung of the ladder and the ladder leg can impact left or right legs and the resulting injury is uh, induces much limping uh, after the work. So ladder leg may, uh, may occur immediately after descending the ladder or it may not manifest itself until some days later when you're asked to move furniture about the house. Ladder leg is uh, not necessarily a permanent condition. It can be cured with treatment and abstinence from ladder climbing. Uh, and there are medications available for ladder leg. See your primary care physician to get treatment for this uh, important medical condition. And by the way, nothing on the Down East Mike podcast is to be construed as real medical advice. See your PCP for everything like that. Happy birthday today to Marjorie of Biddeford. She turns 91 years old. Marjorie has worked tirelessly over the years to increase literacy in the Biddeford area. And Marjorie's not a name that we hear a lot today, do we? You know, Marjorie wasn't just born yesterday. Happy birthday to Ellis. Uh, Machias Ellis will not tell us how old he is. Just that he's no stranger to hard times, but he's still looking forward to retirement in Ocala not too long from now, I would hope. Let's look at a dandelion salad recipe. It came from this day in 1980, April 22nd, and... Uh, Dandelion salad, right about that time, although it just seems so cold and damp out there, nothing's growing yet. A large salad bowl of young, tender dandelion greens, six slices of bacon, a quarter cup of butter or margarine, got to have that, half a cup of cream. Uh, what else do we have in it? Uh, oh, quarter teaspoon, pap teaspoon paprika quarter cup of vinegar and a dash of pepper and you want to carefully wash the dandelion greens using only the tender new growth shake dry and place in a wooden bowl fry the bacon until crisp drain on paper towels and crumble over the greens can you picture this all happening pour off all but one tablespoon of the bacon grease Add and heat butter and cream over a low heat. Add the paprika, brown sugar, vinegar, and pepper and cook over low heat until the mixture thickens slightly, stirring constantly. Do not boil. Pour the hot dressing over the greens. Toss and serve. That sounds almost like one of those recipes where you uh, throw away the dish and eat the pan. Oh, strawberry pie with meringue crust. This is on the same page here. Two pints of strawberries sliced, a half a cup of sugar, three tablespoons of cornstarch to thicken it, a cup of water, one cup of heavy cream and whipped, and a meringue crust. Then it goes on and on about making it strawberry pie with meringue crust. Hawaiian pork loaves, some other recipes. But we thought the dandelion salad was... Pretty interesting. Wonder how that works out. On this day, yeah, it was one day before, about 1980. It's a picture uh, in the paper of Rosie Ruiz of New York City, the apparent woman's winner of the Boston Marathon Monday, receives help from a Boston police officer after crossing the finish line with an unofficial time of two hours, 31 minutes. She looks like she's in agony. The time, if it holds up, will set a new woman's mark, breaking last year's standard set by Cape Elizabeth Joan Benoit. However, at press time, her finishing time was still being checked. She was rewarded with a medal, a laurel wreath, and a silver bowl. But eight days later, she was stripped of her victory 
after race officials learned she jumped into the race about a mile before the finish line. Now her story all kind of unraveled as, as things went along. She was unknown in the running world and her victory raised suspicions because it was a 25 minute improvement over her New York City Marathon time. The, uh, the controversy that was surrounding Ruiz overshadowed Bill Rogers of Maine, who won the men's division for the f uh, record fourth year in a row. Good old Bill Rogers. He actually ran that really fast. He'd be right up there today. He had a little ad here from the New York Telefo uh, New England Telephone. What to do if your phone isn't working but you are. And it shows a, a lady all smartly dressed with a phone big old clunky desk phone under her arm and her portfolio under the other. Now you don't have to hang around the house waiting for us to come to you. If you have the right kind of Bell phone, and most of the people in this area do, just bring it into the phone center store at your convenience. We'll take care of the problem right on the spot, still at no extra charge. Is yours the right kind? If you can unplug your phone, you can bring it to the phone center store. To see if yours is the right kind, check the cord on the receiver. If it plugs in, the phone does too. All you have to do is unclip the cord where it connects to the wall and be sure to bring the cord with you. For wall models, lift up on the base and pull the phone toward you. It unplugs automatically. Uh, what else is in this ad? In many cases, the problem will be in our lines and not in your phone. Probably in about 99% of the cases. So before you bring your phone in, check to see if your other phones are working properly. Like, why wouldn't you do that? If you're still not sure, call our repair service as usual. We don't want you to be without service a second longer than necessary. And it shows the big old wall-mounted phone and then the desk phone there. And you would carry it into the store Back before cell phones were in heavy use, the uh, Bangor Daily News, 1971, uh, they had a daily circulation, 78,859 uh, copies were sold the previous day, and you've got to wonder how many they sell today in comparison. Uh, the forecast for this day in 1971 was a chance of rain Highs in the 50s, about, about what it is today, the living cost was up. They noted that the higher food prices helped drive the cost of living up 0.3% uh, in March. But the first quarter of 1971 still recorded the lowest rate of inflation in four years. It was the lowest since the first quarter of 1967 and even below the inflation pace President Nixon had predicted for this year. And they didn't have the price of milk, though. That's what we like to look at. How much does milk cost? Uh, on this day, 1971, uh, story about mobile homes being real popular. Ten years ago, the average new home in Bangor cost $17,200. Last year, that same dwelling would set you back 28000 if you could afford it. Most people couldn't. So they went out and bought trailers. Three out of every four new dwelling units purchased by Maine families in 1970 were mobile homes. And the swing toward trailer living was so pronounced during the late 1960s that one area town, Holden, now has almost as many trailers as conventional homes. Uh, Eben Elwell, who's the director of the Maine Housing Authority, feels that mobile homes will not solve Maine's long-range housing problem. He said modular homes, the third choice, may have stemmed the trailer invasion. He reports that new trailer sales in Maine during the first quarter of 71 are off 22% and claims the tremendous public response to the state's modular home demonstration project is a prime factor in the decline and they talk about modular homes being built in a factory like trailers, but they're roughly twice as large. They sit on a permanent foundation and are constructed to last 40 years instead of seven, the depreciation life of most trailers. And how many trailers are out there that are more than 40 years old? I bet a lot. 
uh, about the same as the module of homes. Uh, these two companies can produce more houses than were built in the entire state of Maine last year, said Elwells. It's two of the 17 modular construction firms have taken the plunge, building instant home factories in Maine. One plant under construction in Biddeford would be turning out two to three new homes a day. Dead River Company is one of the firms entering the field and will manufacture modular homes in Bangor. LL feels Maine will be in big trouble if the mobile home invasion isn't slowed down. I'm not against trailers. They fill a vacuum and answer to an immediate housing need, but they're not the long-term answer. Isn't that interesting? What's going to happen to those trailers after they wear out seven years? Who's going to be living in them, and will they be safe? And then they talk about hundreds of abandoned trailers strung across the main countryside. I don't know if that really happens. On this day in 1980, in the Bangor Daily News, we found a story about the germ war simulated under New York. For four days in June 1966, the U.S. Army contaminated much of the New York subway system in Manhattan with a harmless simulant agent called Basilis Subtilivar Niger. The members of the Army Special Operations Division, according to the official report obtained Monday, were testing the vulnerability of U.S. subway systems to bacteriological warfare in devising methods of delivery that could be used offensively against a potential enemy. And what better way to do it than on your own citizens? It noted Russia has subway systems in Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Tiflis, and Baku. In North America, the report said there are subways in Boston, Chicago, etc., etc. It did not say whether germ warfare tests were conducted in any system outside New York, and we'll probably never know. The simulated subway attack was a project of mind control and drug testing programs by the Army and CIA during the 1950s and 60s, when authorities feared that Soviets and Communist Chinese were developing sophisticated methods of killing, incapacitating, or brainwashing individuals and entire populations. The full report was obtained under a Freedom of Information Act request that came from the Church of Scientology. I mean, who else wants to know the truth? The operatives, according to the 70-page document, dropped their simulated germs through sideway, sidewalk gratings over subway stations, or they rode between cars discarding basilisk-filled light bulbs which smashed on the tracks. Suction from passage of the subway trains pushed or pulled the substances for miles. Special operations men were armed with dispensing and monitoring devices disguised as cameras and suitcases. Mission impossible. Isn't that something? Germ warfare. There's a picture in the paper. For, uh, it was the first and only car and the guy's name was Burley Cave. What a great name. Burley's here. Burley Cave, an 80-year-old retired shoe factory worker, said he felt just as injured as his 1925 Model T Ford when it struck a parked car on a Hannibal, Missouri street. He said new brake shoes he installed just before the accident failed. Cave said he bought the car as his first for $660 in 1925. He's been driving it ever since. He said he expected to keep it for the rest of his life. One car in a lifetime is enough if a person gives it loving care. There's a picture of Burley Cave there. When the cop uh, got his foot up on the sideboard and they're looking inside the Model T. You get like 27 miles to the gallon of those things. On this day in 1892, there's a story about dairy farming in Maine. Uh, they go on and on. It's quite a long story. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of it here. As far as locality is concerned, Maine stands preeminent among the states. We have the pastures, the clean running streams fed from the purest springs, 
and our hillside pastures are swept by the ozone-laden breezes from over forest, lake, and mountain. Maine has a class of cows that may well stand beside those of any other state. But Maine farms are not carrying the number of cows the territory is capable of supporting, and it's evident that many more will be kept within our borders before another decade shall roll around. Maine at present has about five and one-half cows per square mile of territory. But as our state is large enough to spread over all the rest of New England and have several thousand square miles left, about half of which territory is improved, it will be but fair to reckon her stock of cows on that basis would make the proportion about 11 cows per square mile. That's the number of the milking stock of New Hampshire. Vermont has 23 cows per square mile, Massachusetts 21, Rhode Island 19, and Connecticut 29. And going out of New England, we find New York, the great cow state of the Union, having 31 cows per square mile of territory. Maine then has the smallest number of cows, according to a territory allowing one half only to be improved. So we don't have enough cows. Uh, all the best dairy breeds of cattle are fairly well represented among our dairymen here in Maine, and purebred stock are owned in such numbers that the demand in that direction affords no ground upon which to build a boom. We have good cows, but not enough of them. There's no reason why we may not double the amount of dairy stock and increase the average yield of butter 50% per head and make a relative gain in the average cost of production. It's a long way of about saying he thought that we could support more cattle here. Every dairy enterprise already started in Maine with those which may be established in the future are largely dependent on the capability of one man, the butter maker. As much depends upon this as upon any one thing. A cheap man in that place generally pro proves a dear one in the end. We do not lack men of skill and intelligence, but the position calls for men schooled in the art, having experience in the line of advance which has been made in the methods of dairying keeping abreast of the progress that is going on in the other dairy states. Anyway, uh, last night in the, or fast night, and we're going to get to fast night in just a second, fast night in the rain, the Lewiston City Building stood up in a blaze of beauty for the first time this day, 1892. Every window was alight. Every gas jet in the structure was burning, and from top to bottom it shone. The bright lights, the clear doorway, and the opening of the grand entrance attracted many visitors. Judge Whitehouse called during the day. You have, said he, the handsomest building in Maine and one of the handsomest public halls I ever saw. Mr. McKenney of McKenney and Waterbury from Boston said, We have good buildings down our way, but this hall is certainly hard to equal. In the building are... 576 gas jets. All of them are four-foot burners. When all are alight, it uses about 2,000 feet an hour. This would rarely occur. The main hall itself has almost half of these jets. The big chandelier is a sun in itself with the tapers burning beautifully. Superintendent Scott of the Lewiston Gas Works says he was pleased with the way the building lighted. It was brighter than even he expected. The main hall is wonderfully well lighted, perfectly in fact. We like that the wrought iron chandelier at the main entrance, some do not. To us it seems very artistic and eminently fit. It's just the chandelier for granite portals. That would have been a sight to see, huh? A uh, story out of Portland, Joseph Ivy. The 11-year-old incendiary who confessed to firing the farm buildings of Mr. White near Allen's Corner on Wednesday was arraigned Friday before Judge Elder and pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to the state reformatory for 10 years or during his minority. He also confessed to firing a building and committing many crimes of larceny at his home in Baldwin, Mass. He's a little fire by, wasn't he? The Anderscoggin Drives, both of Staples Drives, 
from Swift River reach Rumford Falls Thursday and are now in camp near the townhouse. They are taken into the Canton Boom, such lumber as Mr. Staples has along the stream from the Falls Inn. Uh, they noted that George Woolstone cooks for them, and John Reed has a few men up Swift River, but the water is so low, very little headway can be made driving that stream. Here was a question about the sunflower seed. Shall we eat the seed of the sunflower in return for the corn which Uncle Sam proposes to teach the Russians how to eat? It's seriously suggested that we shall adopt a few hints from them respecting the usefulness of the sunflower. There are regions in the West which might be most profitably utilized for the cultivation of this plant, which has been found so valuable for food purposes in the empire uh, Empire of the Tsar, that 750,000 acres in that country are annually planted with it. Two kinds there are chiefly, uh, one which bears small seeds used for making oil, while the other type of sunflower produces big seeds, which are consumed in enormous quantities by the common people, the same way that peanuts are eaten here, except that they are devoured raw. Talking about eating sunflower seeds. A little story about uh, students in Alaska. The progress in education in Alaska is shown from the fact that on June 30th last, there were 24 schools having a total enrollment of 1,851 pupils. 1892, there were 1,800 kids in school in Alaska. The population of Bogota, the capital of the United States of Colombia, decreased uh, 854 during 1891. There were 2,300 births and 3,100 deaths in the city. I did not know that Bogota was originally called in the state, the United States of Colombia. Uh, grip patients in Dover, England are compelled to remain indoors. If found outside, they are liable to a fine of $25. So in on 1892, they were finding patients of the grip. If they, it's kind of a pandemic, I guess. Let's look at fast day. The, the Union services in Lewiston on fast day were held at the Friends Church on College Street at 10.30 a.m. It was led by Reverend Mr. Farr. A social meeting wherein many views upon the proper observation of fast day were expressed. The prayer of the righteous availeth much, said Mr. Farr in the opening of the talk. The Lord reigneth was the subject chosen for his address. He said he thought the church was blamable because fast day is not properly observed. The church did not raise the public opinion high enough upon this subject. And then they went on talking about all the people in attendance. Well, fast day was a holiday observed in some parts of the United States between 1670 and 1991. A day of public fasting and prayer, it was a, traditionally observed in the New England states. It had its origin in the days of prayer and repentance proclaimed in the early days of the British American colonies by the royal governors, and it was designed to avoid such calamities as plagues, natural disasters, or crop failures. It was common to hold a fast day before the spring planting. It was observed by church attendance, uh, fasting, and abstinence from secular activities. Uh, the earliest known fast day was proclaimed in Boston in 1670, and the colonial province of New Hampshire proclaimed a fast day in 1680, seeking God's blessing on an upcoming General Assembly and for good weather during spring planting. The following year, when illness struck John Cutt, who was the president of the province of New Hampshire, and a comet was seen in the sky, the province de designated March 17, 1681 as fast day in response to these signs of divine displeasure. Those comets in the sky are always an indication of that. The image shows, uh, they had a picture here, that Jonathan Belcher, colonial governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay declared a fast day in 1735 because of the holy anger of Almighty God evidently manifested in the various judgments inflicted on us, specifically highlighting a mortal sickness. 
that had been divinely inflicted on the colonists. And then it lost its significance as a religious holiday in the late 19th century. Uh, Massachusetts abolished it in 1894. That's when they brought in uh, Patriots Day. Uh, Maine uh, celebrated fast day on used to on the third Monday in April changed it to Patriots Day as well. And Massachusetts and Maine still have Patriots Day. Fast day actually continued in New Hampshire until 1991 when the late April holiday signifying uh, only the opening of the summer tourist season. Isn't that interesting? The state dropped fast day in 1991, replacing it with the January Civil Rights Day, which they renamed Martin Luther King Jr. Day in 1999. Well, it is time for our insect of the instant, and today we're looking at Lethoceris americanus, Lethoceris americanus, the giant water bug, two to four inches long. It's a bug, it's aquatic, it's the largest member of the order Hemeptera, true bugs, in the U.S. and Canada. These formidable bugs are known by other names, uh, including Bellastomidids and uh, water roaches, toe biters, and electric lights bugs. They can, the adults can fly and are attracted to lights at night, so they're often found in parking lots and near other bright lights such as porch lights. And they hit that screen door in the summer, that buzzing sound is scary. Uh, a giant water bug can hold its own against a hungry polar bear any day. These brown, flattened bugs lurk in freshwater habitats around the world ambushing their prey and sucking it dry. Giant water bugs, a uh, member of the true bug order Hem Hemeptera, we said that, all true bugs have piercing, sucking mouth parts, among other characteristics. The largest species of giant water bug can exceed four and a half inches. They're oval shaped, they have pincher-like front appendages that capture and hold prey. Their rear legs are especially flattened and have tiny hairs to help propel them through the water. They like to hide in mats of vegetation just under the surface of the water. I just don't want to see one of these things. They eat tadpoles, small fishes, insects, and other arthropods. Some are known to kill prey many times their own size, I bet. Grasping victims by raptorial front legs, they inject venomous digestive saliva into their prey. This allows them to then suck out the liquefied remains. That sounds nice. How do these bugs breathe underwater? Insects don't have lungs like humans, but instead they obtain up oxygen through tiny holes in the body wall, spiracles, that connect to air-filled tubes called tracheae. Giant water bugs have an appendage on the tip of the abdomen that extends above water to collect oxygen. That's why you'll sometimes see them tipped at an angle facing downward underwater with just the rear end at the surface breathing. When the giant water bug dives underwater, it carries air as a bubble under its wings, which can slowly diffuse into its body while it remains submerged. Wow, they're scary. Parental care is reversed with these bugs. The males rear the young. The males will carry the developing eggs on their back until they hatch. Males of the of the genus Lethoceris guard eggs glued to vegetation until they hatch. And then we talked about the uh, electric light bugs, the other name, due to the propensity of some species to fly towards lights at night. Sometimes they land on your backyard pool overnight. They like the light reflecting off the water. Giant water bugs can deliver a painful, though non-toxic, bite between the toes of unsuspecting human feet. This explains one of their common names, toe biter. They can feign death, becoming rigid for several minutes if removed from the water only to snap back to life. Another defense when disturbed is the giant water bug's ability to squirt unpleasant smelling fluid for a few feet. This is just... Anyway, go look for a giant water bug. Let's look at the weather forecast and we'll kick you out for today. If you're in New England today in Maine, uh, for today, mostly sunny with a high of 57 degrees. 
southwest wind around 5 miles per hour, becoming partly cloudy tonight with a low around 38. For Sunday, a 30% chance of showers after 1 p.m., otherwise fair in the morning, increase in clouds late in the day with a high near 54. And then it rains. It rains and rains and rains. Sunday night, rain with a low around 41. Rain Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Friday next week, sun's coming out. So look forward to that. Well, that is the Down East Mike podcast. For today, Saturday, April 22nd, 2023. Till next time, this is Down East Mike wishing you and your loved ones a day that is full of grace, love, and kindness. We'll see you. Well, it snowed too much that cold New England day, and I knew my body, Stephen, wouldn't be over to play. So I looked out my window at that Booth Bay Harbor scene. And I wished all the answers could come so quick and clean And I'm not looking to find my youth Oh, I would settle for a little bit of truth And I just want to know where I belong And I'm stumbling on Main Street I'm singing my song So I walked to the corner for cigarettes and more And you know I hate the attitude of everyone in that store But you can hate too much and love not enough Oh, I rue the day I came back to this town And I'm not looking to find my youth Oh, I will settle for a little bit of truth And I just want Stumbling on Main Street And I'm singing this song I'm not looking to find my youth Oh, I would settle for a little bit of truth And I just want to know where I belong I'm stumbling on me 
singing this. 